to become property. And that's where parenting and childhood come in. Because, well, civilization wouldn't continue without propagating these ideas, enforcing them onto the flesh, putting a shroud of death, death of the will, death of your wild purpose to cover you up from the world. So, um, and with that comes the question of, well, how do we know the world? And what do we transmit to our children? Um, and in this, well, we always come back to the same uh, question, the same problem I see. Uh, we cannot uh, ignore it, is the story of the fall. The story of the fall into toil, into agricultural society. And it comes with knowledge. What what is what what we are we hear what is being conveyed to us, what is named as knowledge. But when you we look closer at it, what is conveyed as knowledge <laughs> um, what is being conveyed to us as knowledge, what uh, is in fact based on alienation. So if you separate yourself from the world, you alienate yourself from the world, you cannot know the world. So it will become easier to hurt the world. It will become easier to exploit and kill the world. And with the domestication then, um, with this so-called knowledge, having separated from the real uh, feeling of what the world is living, you substitute it with what you think you know. And we come to, <laughs> to John's uh, idea of the symbolic and language being at the root of this violence, it totally ties in. Um, you come to the uh, to the point that the only way to really be with the world and to know the world and to transmit something of value to our children is to undo this knowledge that separates us. And and some of the ca but but it's in truth like we see it's it's so structural in our language that it's really difficult. Like if if we are going to be dealing with children, ultimately we'll be using this language, we'll be using the words naked, nude, appropriate, appropriate. And the connections will be there. How do we overcome them? How do we overcome this knowledge? Well, another angle to this, uh, to this separation is, uh, uh, is uh, categories, because that comes also with well, with, with the whole machine of domestication. Categories of human, non-human, animals, <coughs> ethnic groups, children, adults. They're all based on classifying beings, all beings as separate. So in classifying beings as separate, it becomes easy to know them and to objectify them and, uh, um, and to reduce them to a purpose that has been invented by domestication. So, for example, you have children's books. This is a zebra. A zebra runs in the forest for the lion to eat. This is a lion. A lion exists for such and such. This is a tree. A tree exists for, for us to have air. A bird. A bird exists for a cat to eat. So everything becomes domesticated in its, 
in the way we classify. Because ultimately, do we know why they exist? Do we, is, is a child separate from an old person, from an adult? Is a woman that different from a man? Is an African that different from a Russian? Is an American different from an Inuit? So, but by classifying and knowing the world in these classifications, we, and knowing it and training our children to see these classifications as natural, as structural, we continue the, the whole problem of domestication, the whole violence of domestication, because ultimately, even the children start playing into the purpose for domestication. So who are our children? Why do we have them? So um, in, uh, in the wilderness, if everybody exists for their own purpose and their own sake, all that we can do is help the child grow into this world, tamper as little as possible with the world, leave it intact, and proceed on to where we don't know. Um, in domestication, since everything becomes appropriated and becomes appropriate, then children become a resource too. Land becomes a resource. Trees, um, everything that we see a purpose for is multiplied. Everything that we do not see a purpose for can be easily dismissed, done with, annihilated. So what happens, um, uh, so yeah, There's, um, um, yeah, I was, uh, I'll, I'll read you a quote actually. Uh, these ideas have been expressed in different ways uh, throughout like, our civilized history. Obviously, you know, people have observed and have noticed these contradictions. Um, I find a very interesting one by um, Bentham, Jeremy Bentham, a philosopher. Um, and I'll read, um, this really quite the uh, well expressed uh, uh, idea. He says, the day has been, I grieve to say, in many places, it is not yet past, in which the greater part of the species under the denomination of slaves have been treated by the law exactly upon the same footing as in England, for example, the inferior races of animals are still. The day may come when the rest of the animal creation may acquire those rights, which never could have been withholden from them but by the hand of tyranny. The French have already discovered that the blackness of the skin is no reason why a human being should be abandoned without redress to the caprice of a tormentor. It may come one day to be recognized that the number of the legs, the velocity of the skin, or the termination of the os sacrum are reasons equally insufficient for abandoning a sensitive being to the same fate. What else is it that should trace the insuperable line? Is it the faculty of reason? Or perhaps the faculty of discourse? But a full-grown horse or dog is beyond comparison a more rational being as well as a more conversable animal than an infant of a day, or a week, or even a month old. But suppose the case were otherwise, what would it avail? The question is not, can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? Jeremy Bentham wrote this in 1823, and it is, the suffering that is imposed by this knowledge, and at the same time, we are alienated from this suffering by the same knowledge, because this knowledge 
naturalizes our alienation and our suffering. And our suffering depends on the suffering of the world, of our children that we train to suffer from early childhood. Um, it's interesting that, for example, uh, there's the theory of stress, how organisms develop. And in the West, it was taken, uh, for example, I don't remember the name of the German physiologist, uh, but a Quebecois Canadian uh, physiologist, Cellier, uh, looked at stress that, okay, there's, there has to be stress, like everything develops under stress. Uh, there's a lot of stress, and stress is negative. So with civilization, more and more stress comes into our lives. How do we deal with it? Well, a whole like Canadian pharmaceuticals device, um, you know, all sorts of medications to take care of the stress. Um, if you approach the question of uh, of organisms from an anarchist perspective, uh, there's a Russian. Uh, there was a Russian, uh, actually two Russian physiologists. Uh, one was before the Soviet Revolution, uh, Ukhtomsky, and another one, his student, uh, continued his work during the Soviet Union. And they approached it from an uh, anarchist perspective. Ukhtomsky from Dostoevsky, which is uh, religious anarchism and he took the idea of the double and it's very important in how he, he said organisms develop in relationship to stress that is regulated by from within in response to the other and the other can be anything it could be for example a microbe would, would respond to, stra uh, to heat. If it's too much heat, the microbe would feel, would know, it could adjust or withdraw. Um, he took it then, okay, to children. Children develop the ability to know the world from how much stress they can take and how they react. To, that, to, to the forces, such as parents, society. Um, and the most important, and you know, as organisms develop, the most important uh, element in that relationship becomes the understanding of each other. And what he took from Dostoevsky is the double, leaving behind the double, that is, you approach the other with respect not to stress them so as not to crush them, but to offer enough room for that organism or person to respond to you. And um, Arshavsky took it even further. He said, okay, well, let's look at children, how they develop for example, you know, how children are born. Children are born in extremely stressful situations, in host like 20th century hospitals. They're medicalized, they're already categorized. They're known, um, they're categorized with diseases, with something that needs to be controlled even before they're born. And the amount of stress that is imposed right from the beginning ignores the fact that you need to leave freedom to that child to respond to the world according to its readiness, its needs. It needs the stress, it's positive, but it's positive only when the organism feels it can regulate it from within. If too much comes against the forces that try to thrive, it will be crushed. And it's interesting that as a physiologist, Arshavsky went, well, he read uh, uh, Peter Kropotkin's um, uh, challenge to Darwinism um, 
the evolution uh, through mutual aid and cooperation. So he said, okay, through working together in the wild, and that apparently species thrive not uh, through competition uh, and the survival of the fittest. Species thrive through cooperation and mutual aid. So it's really important. And that in the wild, the wild are moral. In civilization, you think you have a choice. And by thinking you have a choice, you will commit, you, you're immediately become amoral. Um, to make it clearer what I say, I'll, I'll read um, a debate that uh, um, a Russian education uh, pedagogical uh, theorist, Nikitin, had an interview with Arshavsky. Um, In the natural context, morality is characteristic of all living creatures because animals can act only in accordance with nature, but the human being can allow himself to act against nature, that is to behave amorally. Conscience is a given state at birth. A question arises then, why does the human being allow himself to ignore nature's laws? The reason is that all living organisms are changeable under pressure to which they adapt and at a certain point they could begin to act against their own interests. Um, so in connection between the dominanta or that what regulates the inner, the, the stress that the organism is capable of taking, the double and the interlocutor, Uktomsky's borrowed the term double from Dostoevsky he, sa he continues that, thus, it turns out that the human being sees in the world and in others only himself. And here lies his greatest punishment. By looking through the domesticated lens, through your appropriated, appropriate suffering, you begin to see it as natural and you impose it on everything you know, all the categories, be it a cat, be it a tree, be it your child. And you don't hear when, and ch children obviously are not, they're born into domestication, but they have not appropriated the domesticated, the language first of all, and the whole <coughs> domesticated discourse and, and mode. So they react to it. They scream, they cry, they rebel until they're crushed. And how after, uh, after their, uh, the whole experience of birth, like how does the civilization proceed with domesticating children? Well, um, first of all, alienating parents from their old child, even by considering that an expert should take care of your child. Apart from the fact that you have to deliver in a medical environment, after that it's a professional pedagogue who should be taking care of the child. And, well, what's professionalization if not ultimate alienation. Now, if we look at the other side of how we know the world in the wild is through empathy. You know how you feel. You know how the other feels. If you're out there in the jungle, a dinosaur might catch you. 
you're afraid, you would know what a gazelle would feel. Maybe we cannot know what to do with all this, but by knowing that, you would be really careful with imposing even more, with interfering more, with domesticating more, with taking, with appropriating the will and the purpose of that gazelle, of that cat, of, of that child. Um, but how, do we, how can we transmit this ability to know through empathy if we don't see our children? It's a pedagogue who's supposed to take care of them, a professional. And what the professional does, the professional, even in the, under, I, I know I'm surrounded by teachers, like my, most of my family are teachers, most of my friends are teachers, and a lot of the times they come with the best intentions. We love children, they say. Maybe you think you love children, but how can you transmit empathy? How can you empathize with 45 children in front of you, or even 10 at the same time, having them sit, having, having them trained to be alienated from their physiological needs of hunger, of going to the bathroom because you have to teach them, you have to control them that within this period you don't eat, you don't go to the bathroom, you don't run, you don't go after a bird in the sun and wonder what's happening outside. So by closing these children with an adult who is not there because they're, go they're going to be there anyways. Because the minute you stop the payroll, the adult will vanish. The adult is not there after five if a child needs, if, if a child loves the teacher and has a problem, has a question in the middle of the night, a fear, and wants to talk to that teacher. The teacher is not paid to be there after five. So we are training the child that the child has to be surrendered, that in this cold system in which everybody is trapped, the teacher, the parents, and most of all, the children. So, um, and uh, well, and, and this this alienation comes uh, through through every like you know after talk, for example, the, the, the teaching establishment. Uh, what happens after the child is home with the parents after the professional care? Um, how do how do pa parents connect or claim to connect with their children? What has been a major element in our lives to define this, our so-called connection? Well, internet is comes later, but before that, it's language, but it's written language. And what's written language? Um, if you read anthropology, uh, for example, well, there's Ong, uh, who's uh, a historian, uh, criticized written, uh, well, wrote a lot of morality. There's uh, Jack Goody, for example, uh, an anthropologist. Uh, he wrote about culture of flowers and culture of abun you know, surplus. Um, and he, they trace uh, the written language necessarily came with uh, with having to note down um, what uh, well it comes with agriculture, it comes with uh, subjugation, and it comes with the need to remind people of this new knowledge that they owe. They owe their time, their lives, their crops, their cattle. 
So it started off by noting down who owed whom, and immediately solidifying that which did not exist. So, okay, with John we talk a lot, like yeah, we write, um, but ultimately we read, and ultimately we transmit this to our children, but what we transmit has in, inherent in its structure, in its in its own roots, like you cannot, like you take away the roots and it's gone. In its root, it's this knowledge of abuse, of exploitation, of appropriation, of making you appropriate by appropriating you, your time, <coughs> and everything else. So, how do parents communicate? So many children's books. So there are children who watch television, and at this point, I'm not even sure. Like again, you know, which is the lesser of of the three evils: <laughs> the internet, the television, or or children's books? Because in children's books, the the structure of oppression, the meaning of oppression becomes, well, it is, it is being called knowledge, it is being sold to us as something inherently good, but even, not only that, even indispensable. Like you can't have, like you can't have a successful human being if you don't teach maximum by the age of five. Like that's too late. Like some of the people both like, oh, mine already knows the alphabet at two. And um, I could be critiquing all day, but then what are the uh, what, what are the solutions? Like what do we do with this? And my idea actually, and that's why I'm really when Nikisha wrote to me, I was and I checked out the website and you know how you guys live your principles and ideas it was really really inspiring because the only thing that we can transmit is not by teaching knowledge not by imposing these categories of alienation the only thing we can do is by trying as much as for, as our humble selves permit us to show by example how to empathize with whoever we think has reason or has no reason, has language, has no language, has four legs, has a tail, has no tail. How to empathize and through empathy, through empathy and through listening to <coughs> abandoning your double not listening to your domesticated self, listening to the other, in pain or in joy. Only then we can transmit to our children, and first of all, by responding to their cries, holding them to us, taking the time to go outside and marveling at everything living. Only then, maybe, we can overcome this alienation and help these children grow up into healthy and happy human beings. So this is my lullaby for the planet. <coughs> and um, I'm sure there will be lots of questions, and we can go on from there. I think maybe it'd be good to talk uh, some 
more specifics. Like, I feel like we've addressed a lot of, like, kind of broad negatives, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think it'd be good if we could talk about some more, like, really specific positive ways to, you know, uh, in terms of, of parenting and, like, what we can do, like, very specifically uh, to, I guess, do what you're, you're saying. <laughs> Yeah, I understand your concerns uh, with specific examples. Um, well, there's there's danger in talking about specifics because my experiment is something that worked for me, and I can never like I can share with you my experiment, um, but I I mean I can never tell you like okay, this this is what works and you. You know, you all go out and do the same thing. But for me, my journey be began really like uh, maybe from my like from my childhood. I started talk, uh, speaking really late, according to well, I was born in Russia, Soviet Union, and there's like this race. Kids should start talking really early, reading really early. You know, like going to school really early. You know, the whole galore. Um, and I just didn't speak. And everyone thought there was something wrong with me. So like, until three and a half, I didn't speak. And you know what happened? Uh, and that actually made me aware later on, uh, on the problems of language. My most vivid memories are from before I started to speak. And, and all the experts will tell you this is not possible. Children are not aware. You don't remember things until maybe after you're 10. So that made, like, it's very interesting because when I didn't speak, I didn't know language, I observed. I defined my, my veganism already before I was five. I knew what I saw was wrong. And I believe every child is capable of being of, of making an ethical stance as early as possible and this is what um, these uh, Uchtomsky and Arshavsky you probably have difficulty with the <laughs> Russian names uh, what they're talking about it's like you cannot make a moral decision within civilization within language within domestication um, so language like where you want to start with my experience shows me that, um, well, don't impose language. Kids will get it anyways. Well, you know, I didn't impose language on my kid. She started <laughs> speaking fluently at one. <laughs> She's like, at one and a half, she was making sentences with vocabulary, like in Russian, but you know, GRE level. Okay, I didn't, but I didn't impose it. It was her own stress level that she was regulating in response to her environment. And she took what she took. The same thing, I, I didn't want her to learn how to read too early before she specifically identified her, uh, her moral and ethical stance in life. I didn't want her to be exposed to all these ideas and taking them just because it's written word, that's authority. No, it's written word, that's oppression. Regardless, even mine, mine, if you take it as authority, it is oppression. It's there, just, just my ideas, my, my experiences. Welcome to take it, welcome to throw it away. So the same with children. You leave it, she taught herself how to read when she was ready. And she would debate with the literature. It wasn't authority, she would debate with the literature. Um, say like, you know, coming out from this domesticated and medicalized, me, the medical establishment exists there to control us, to tell us how we are ill and how we are well. Nobody can tell us, nobody can tell you, except for you, whether you're ill or well. Now how you deal with it, is, it depends on the situation, it depends on your environment, on, but you know, maybe you'll go and ask for help if you can't deal with it. But in non-domesticated society, People, animals, know where to find the herbs. Even, uh, I, I've read somewhere, even like uh, with rabies, some animals don't necessarily, like apparently it's like this deadly virus, but some animals 
know where to find some you know special herbs and not every animal develops rabies apparently um, well I have no way of checking it but you know it makes sense um, with with all these vaccinations that we've been given against flu against it, like all these scares oh you, you know uh, you're going to play this whatever chicken flu, what, what are all these chicken? pig flu swine flu whatever flu that's it like everyone's going to die well Okay, six people died, and how many people died from domestication, from military, from army, from starvation? Like the whole food, how it's used, how we use it, how we obsess about it. That's part, like, so it's something that, um, I cannot give you specific examples except for that, but like everything you address, you have to see, like everything you do, you have to see like what are the ethical implications in that and from there you stand well in the end the only thing you can do eventually is to just live your life and not impose your meaning on anybody else even the child so <laughs> does that make more no yeah. it's still vague <laughs> yes um, um okay and then you, you, you. Okay. Thank you for um, can you, all right, can you speak to uh, how, maybe some approaches of how do we go about respecting and defining diversity and even gaining a sense of identity with the other without falling into the trap of classifying and categorizing, like for example, I am an anarchist, or you are a white male, and so, like, or you are, you know, like, how do you respect the experience of the ethnic group, the diverse that we want, and celebrate the differences, and even understanding our own identity and feeling in that, without falling into, I understand you because this is how I classified you, and this is how I categorized you. Yeah, very good question. Um, it's actually a really excellent question because um, Can you summarize it for people over here? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, you have to take the <laughs> I, I'm asking how do the we... The microphone? I'll yeah. just talk really loud. If you stand up, um, you can yeah. yeah. How do we... How do you... What are some approaches or how do we respect diversity and gain a sense of identity without falling into the trap of classifying and categorizing everything? Like, you are an anarchist and so I understand you. You are a black man and so this is what you are to me, this is what you are to yourself, like where does our sense of identity come from, how do we respect the other without making lists and, and concepts and just a chart of this is what that means. Okay, yeah, and I have a really good example, I've heard, uh, I don't know if you've heard, but I haven't investigated it that much, but I've been hearing a lot uh, about nonviolent communication, and apparently it's taking at different levels and degrees, but um, there's some, an acquaintance of mine kept telling me, well, you know, it's, it's really, it, it's the same thing that you're saying, you know, you really have to get into this NVC thing, communication, because it's all about acknowledgement. And you hear the other and you acknowledge. And it's interesting because um, what, I, I don't, I can't speak for everybody, like, or for NVC, but uh, in general, but for this particular person, she liked the fact that you can get away with list, like looking with blank eyes at somebody, you know, complaining or you know bringing forth some issues to her, and then saying, "I hear you. I acknowledge what you're saying." And then she goes and just lives as if she's never heard it. You see, in order to respect the other in whatever form, be it, like whatever form that separ our knowledge separates these categories, you not only acknowledge, but you take responsibility of how you're going to live with that acknowledgement. Like, what is your role in inducing suffering or pain to the other? So you hear and this is what Arshavsky and Muktomsky are talking about when they talk about the double. When you discard your double, your pride, and you really try, 
it's very difficult because ultimately we do approach the world from what we know and through domestication we don't know the world we're alienated we're apathetic like all of us are struggling with that but by trying as hard as you can to really like drop everything and really hear the other even when the other is angry is hurt is screaming hear what is the pain of the other and how am I contributing to it? For example, well, for you here in the States, especially in the South, the tragic history, like the tragic history of the Native Americans, of the Indians, like, is incredible. And I don't know which is worse, when you come and, your ancestors come and kill all the natives here, or whether they kidnap people from Africa and bring them here to build on the land on which you have killed and you continue to live in those buildings well how are you going to listen to the pain of the other and continue living in those buildings why are you not on the streets so hearing the other take, takes lots of guts because ultimately if you really hear and you see that you are perpetrating some tragedy, some like immense suffering, you will not be able to go on living with that. And this will solve so many problems of psychiatry, of pills, of, of, psycho, of psychotherapy. People tell me like, oh, you know, um, we like psychotherapy because, you know, uh, Psychotherapist soothes us, tells us, uh, helps us to overcome our guilt. Like we don't, like we in America, we suffer from guilt, and we want to get away with guilt. Well, you suffer from guilt because you're guilty. How are you going to face it? Yes. Uh, who, who next?